stream. Okay, so if you'd like to open up Matthew chapter 25, we're going to start from verse 31 uh, down to 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd, sep shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteousness into eternal life. Amen. Roger, do you want to come and join us? We're going to all pray together. I invite you, I encourage you to engage your heart in prayer now. Let's pray for Roger as he brings this word to us. Thank you, Lord, for Roger. Thank you that he's here with us today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that is on his heart to share. Thank you, Lord, we're able to share in this time together. Bless him now. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, with your love, and with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be able to share with you, even though we shouldn't be contacting one another physically and breathing all over each other. It did make me think that maybe when we all get to glory, this is unlike a, a little bit of an anticipation yeah. that we can contact so quickly. Amen. And it, we won't be physically necessarily at the distance, but spiritually we are better just tune in straight away like that and we'll rush around the world and all over the other planets and anywhere else to enjoy one another because we are the people of God. Amen. And so we do enjoy one another. I love the church, don't you? Yeah. I love meeting with those who love Jesus. And so it's a great privilege for me this morning to address you through all the hard work of uh, Henry, who's been leading this meeting, and Lydia and others. I should name them all, but uh, there's Joe now on the mechanics or the electronics. I don't know what to call them because I'm so uh, dim with all these things. But they've done all this hard work so that we can all share with each other like this. And I want to say, too, to assure those of you who feel very isolated, we're praying for you regularly, continuously. We don't believe that the enemy should get a victory out of these things that are happening. It's not God's work. It's what Jesus says in one of the parables. An enemy has done this, and we want to be in the place where we can overcome the enemy. So we're spending time together, as usual, in this great distance of the Ichthus Fellowship all over the world. And we're sharing together as we go through a specific chapter. We'll be going chapter by chapter, as already Henry has said, on the book of Matthew. Wonderful as the story of Jesus uh, reaches its climax.
but we've just been looking at chapters 24 and 25, which are all about Jesus coming again and the end of things. And there's some problems about that. Come to that in a minute. There are three problems that we're going to look at. When you read the Bible, you see, if you only go to your favorite passages, which a lot of us do, we don't get to the problem stuff. We avoid it. But there are problems, and we're meant to grapple with those problems because they lead us deeper into understanding God and we're deeper into being able to obey him and see where he's going and what he's doing. And we've reached this passage in what is called the eschatological passages of 24 and 25 of Matthew. And I want to just divide them into various parts in a minute. And then we see this passage which tells us of the Lord sorting out the sheep and the goats, you know? And some people find that difficult too. They find it difficult because they can't quite understand how that fits in with salvation through grace, by faith. They don't know how it really fits in. They thought, I thought everything's all right when we just say, oh, Jesus, come into my heart and life. And they've got a problem. They say, but this looks like salvation by works. Well, we need to think a bit about that. That's another problem. And then the last part of the whole passage that we read about eternal torment, eternal punishment. Hmm, don't like the sound of that too much. And we've got a problem there. What does that really mean about hellfire and going on forever and all that sort of thing? Well, we've got problems as we read the Bible. We've got problems when we reach this passage. But first, I just want to give you a quick rundown, you don't believe it's quick, of 24 and 25, where this great end time passage appears. The first 10 verses of chapter 24, just uh, first 14 verses of chapter 24, lead us up to the fact that the gospel's got to spread throughout the whole of the earth. Then we see the first ending, the end of the Jewish age. Jesus had said that the temple was going to come down, that one stone left upon another. And the disciples couldn't understand that. They thought it was impossible that such a wonderful building, which represents God, and in fact God commanded it should be made. How on earth can we put up and understand that? But Jesus said it was going to be destroyed. That was the end of the Jewish age. It's called the abomination, which makes desolate. Well, that's a difficult one, but we've looked at that, so most of you will understand a little bit about it. And in AD 70, the temple indeed did come down less than a generation, just a few years less than a generation after Jesus had been crucified and risen again. We find that that passage has brought us to an end of something, and the gospel is spreading out through the whole world. Then the next passage goes on, well, the, that, that really goes on from verse, if you've got uh, your Bibles open and want to make notes of them, from verse 15 to verse 35. At verse 35, it all changes. Because instead of saying, and then you'll see this and then you'll see that, it says, now you won't see anything at all. Suddenly something's going to happen. In the, you won't know the day and you won't know the hour. It's not talking about the end of the Jewish period and the end of the temple. It's talking about the end of this age, the church age that we're living in. And that also is a great problem for some people. Have we filled, done enough yet or have we gone through the earth? And it's going to be all of a sudden. But you see, people write all sorts of books about finding out when Jesus is coming again. And Jesus said, you won't know. So that's not very useful, is it? But Jesus then moves into a parabolic method of teaching. And he brings out these parables. And the parables are like two working in the field. Suddenly one's gone, one's not. And then, well, it's like the bridesmaids who miss the, for ten, the ten virgins, five of them miss the wedding feast. Hmm. That's not so good either, is it? But it goes on, oh, somebody was had talents to go and work with this amount of money. Well, you thought about that last week, didn't you? And we know that there is going to be a reward. Some get 10 cities, some get four, four, four cities, and, some, and so on. 
and some get weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't sound so good. But then we reach the passage that we're on today. That was just introduction, and now you're getting worried about how long we're going on. But uh, we will get there. And from verse 31 of chapter 25 through to verse 46, which is our selected passage as we study this wonderful book of Matthew, there we see that Jesus comes and sits upon his glorious throne or throne of glory. And during that period, because that is not just a one-off, it's a period, it's during that that he gathers all the nations together. It's the general resurrection from people of all ages, for everyone will stand before God, and they will be judged and assessed. And those are the things that are a little bit fearful and why we need to think what some people will find as a problem. And this particular challenge of what does it mean that we've got to the end of things? Have we really got there? Was it the end in the destruction of the temple? Well, we go on a bit further. Was it the end when Jesus comes again? But now we've got a period in which the Lord is sitting on his throne. And it's a glorious throne. Some people call it the millennium. Some people see it as the age of the of God preparing us the foyer into eternity. But it's during that period that then the Lord judges everybody. There are those who've already been resurrected, and they are called my brothers and the least ones. And there's the period, this period, where nobody now is going to avoid this resurrection and the judgment, and everybody is raised. Very fearful, very threatening. Got to stand before God and be examined. Makes you think. And having seen that there is this period, I'm emphasizing the period, from Jesus coming until Jesus makes the final judgment, that's another er area and another era. It's in that period that the Lord is going to judge us all and assess where we're involved. Sometimes this ev event is called the um, final judgment or the final vindication. Don't you want to see the world put straight? Don't you want to see things vindicated? When we cry out of the injustice in the world, Jesus is coming to put things straight to justify it. That's justification, to put it all straight. And it's sometimes it's called the, uh, the great white throne because it's pure, scintillating brilliance of Jesus shining out. Not like when he walks through the streets of Galilee, but now in the glory which I had with the Father before the foundation of the world, beaming out into this period and into this moment of judgment. And sometimes it's uh, also got another name. It's got the name that this is the last great assize when we weigh up people's lives and the things that we've done and we want to get out of our system. They never get out of our system unless God judges them. So that's one of the problems that we're dealing with this morning. I wonder how we see the coming of Jesus. It's glorious, brilliant, so brilliant. Yes, but it also, we are warned that some of us would be ashamed at his coming because the lights are brilliant and we're so dark still. Lord, if we're Christians, please cleanse us. Make us ready and able, not be shamed and shamed away from you at your coming. And we're asking, too, that we might be put straight. There may be things to put straight, too, and uh, in parts of our lives and our experience. I need, we need to be vindicated by God. And uh, we, I need it. I don't fancy it, but I need it, don't you? And we're looking for, too, though, the wonderful thing of looking into his brilliance. 
He is the outshining of the brilliance of God's radiance. Wow, I don't know how to find any other words. It seems as though we're trying to understand the ununderstandable, ponder on the imponderable. <laughs> it's beyond us to get hold of the idea of glory. The glory of our Lord Jesus, no longer put down, no longer trampled under feet, but Jesus in where he deserves and always belonged, back in place on his throne. That's great. But here's another problem. There are, it seems as though some people, the sheep, uh, did a lot of good things, whereas the, uh, the other side of the picture, the goats, uh, didn't do very much at all. It's not that they did a lot of bad things, they just didn't do anything, which is equally a threat because God wants us to be positive. We've got to be positively righteous, not just uh, hanging around doing nothing and feeling that we're so f uh, clean. A lot of people do nothing, so they never have any problems. But the problem here is, are we actually positively doing the sorts of things that we read about here. But doesn't that contradict the Apostle Paul, who's forever saying that we're saved by faith without the works of the law? Let's put it this way, if you look at it carefully. It says that uh, all these wonderful things, for I was hungry because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in, invited me. I was naked, wasn't clothed enough, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. Well, they don't let you do too much visiting at the moment, but you can find ways of serving your neighbors, can't you? Isn't that something to do with where we were at today, of finding ways to get food to them and whatever? It's lovely the number of folk. We've got one in our row. We've got some in our row who sent a little note saying they're willing to go to the chemist for us or to go to the, uh, to the supermarket or whatever. Uh, we don't want to spread the virus, so we're trying to keep what the government said. But there are those who are thinking about folk and acting on it if they can. And all these things are positives that we should have done. And in the final analysis, they are called the righteous, the vindicated, the just. And then there are those that did not do it. When do we not do it? And Jesus gives this whole story again. In fact, four times the things that we should have done and we didn't. You don't get lost just because of what you do. You get lost from God because there are things you should have done and you didn't do it. The sins we might say of omission, we just forgot them and didn't bother. But isn't that just people who are the goodies that they get in and the baddies they're thrown out? That's uh, much too trite a way of looking at the message of the whole Bible. But does this not contradict what has already been said, that you're saved by faith and grace only? No, not really. If you look at this very carefully, it says the reason why they were lost is, verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing. The for I was hungry and you didn't do it was not just, as it were, the basic judgment that God might make of certain actions and so on, it's something much deeper than that. It's that it's not adding up all your good things and weighing them against all the bad is. That's not it either. But the reason given for these lost goats, the reason given is not what we've got here. It's the evidence that they were lost. For the little word for can mean for, and it's what's been, it's, it's what the, the, the Lord now says, it's the evidence why you're lost rather than the reason why you're lost. 
If you look out in the window sometimes and you see it's been pouring with rain, you say, it's been raining. And uh, it's been, you know, or it is even rain because the pavement is wet. Because the pavement is wet is the evidence it's been re raining, not why it's raining. And this is what we've got here. It's the evidence in these people's lives. And as they showed their evidence that they were right and they were doing the right things, that is the what reason why they are sheep and not goats. And if they were doing all the wrong things, you might say, okay, well, that was the reason. But that is not the point. The point is they're giving evidence as to whether they're right with God or not. Some of them didn't know much about God. When did we do this and when did we do that? God is very just and throughout the whole of the universe he is wanting to bring about a people who from the foundation of the world were intended to inherit his eternity and dwell with him forever and ever. From the foundation of the world we were meant to move into God's presence and live and serve him. But many people don't really want that deep down. So they don't act because they didn't want that. And that's the sort of picture that's presented to us here. We're not being saved because of our works. Our works are merely the evidence that we are saved. We're not being saved or lost because of uh, uh, the, the things that we haven't done. We, we haven't done them because... We weren't right with God. But this is the beginning, and perhaps one of the clearest statements Jesus made, which is taken up by the Apostle Paul, well, and by Jesus too in the Last Supper. It's the beginning of a company of people who belong to each other and who are going to inherit the future. They're going to inherit eternity together with the Lord. This is the beginning of the body of Christ, which he gives us in the Last Supper. This is my body for you. And that unity is the only real unity you can have. We try unity of politics, unity of philosophies, unity of various objectives, of programs, but they never work in the end. There's only one unity, and it's God's gift, and it's the unity of the body of Christ. And inasmuch as you did it to the, these, you did it unto me, says Jesus. You got it? Inasmuch as you, you did it unto me, it's because the body and the head are the same, really, aren't they? My body and head, I like keeping together. And when I got it together, then life is flowing. It's us out there that's not allowed to come together at this moment. We are all to coming together because we're sharing the same life. And as much as you do it to one another, or as much as people do it to you, they're serving the body of Christ. They're serving Jesus. It's our relationship with Jesus in the end, not the things that we've not done and the things that we've done. It's just that we have a relationship in the way that we live. That Those are the things that matter. Christ-likeness is what I want to feed on, I want to live by. So don't let's get mixed up and think that somehow or other it's what we are doing that saved us. It's Jesus who saves us, and we want him. And to embrace Christ is the warmth and the love of God, which we'll just finish with in a minute. It's the love of God holding us together, gluing us together. So because we are taking this trouble to get through to you as we are today in the electronics of this age. It's all anticipating that closeness and warmth of being together for eternity. So we better get loving and better get sharing. And Jesus is then moving on and says, those who are lost, those who are lost are those, the last verses here, they enter into uh, those who are saved are into eternal life, and those who are lost are those into judgment. Verse 46. They will go away into eternal 
punishment or torment. That word only occurs in one other place. I'm going to read it to you because it's so important to see what this punishment or torment is. It is not like Dante in the period of the uh, Renaissance who had all these great paintings and ideas of different levels and degrees of punishment because you've been a sinner. It's something which is much more serious in the end. It's something that's saying, look at the only other place where this word torment, torment or punishment, it doesn't occur all over the New Testament. It's hard, you've got to look very hard. There's only one other place where this word is used. In John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. Same word, the only other place in the New Testament. Fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because his lo he loved us first. He first loved us. Why are we wanting to keep together in love? Why are we sharing in love and serving one another in love? It's because he first loved us. That's the grace of God. That is God's gift to us. And if you would accept it, whoever's listening today, if you would accept the love of God into your heart and embrace Jesus, serve him by serving his body, that is the place we're always meant to be. And that's where we find life, eternal life. If we refuse to do that, we're asking God to judge us and say, you don't want life, you don't want Jesus, you don't want what I'm offering you. And we torment ourselves, really. We punish ourselves in the end. It's not that God is a great ogre who wants to punish us. It's that we punish ourselves because it torments us that we won't have him. These are problems at first, but when you get look at them deeply, they are wonderful truths, aren't they? And I want to live in that love of God so that I can love other people. That's what I'll do if I live in the love of God, isn't that? And he's sharing it and offering it to us today. If we don't simply open our hearts, say, Lord, please come in with your great love that I might become one of those who loves and go on adding to this wonderful company of the lovers that goes throughout the whole of the world. And we're a part in excess of that movement May God bless us to be the sort of people who are looking forward to the day of judgment rather than afraid of it. Amen.